Thanks, everybody, for coming. Today we've got Dustin Schroeder, who's an assistant professor in the geophysics department at Stanford and was formerly at JPL. Uh, he was a recipient of a 2018 NSF Career Award, and he's, his research is focusing on using radar remote sensing tools to understand the stability of large ice sheets and, and ice on other planets. He's a pretty cool guy in that he starts all the way from working with the instruments themselves through thinking about how they to interpret the data to answering the big questions with them. So let's give him a warm welcome and see what he has to say. Thank you for having me out. It was uh, great to have lunch with all the students and realize like, truly the breadth of expertise here you know, in terms of uh, students and having one department of engineering. So I, I'll try and... <laughs> I uh, develop some intuition here, so regardless of if you're working with chicken embryos or space physics, uh, you, can, you can figure out you know, what ice penetrating radar has to offer you uh, and win some converts here. So, uh, so initially, like the introductory slide that I give, which I'm sure every glaciologist who you've seen give a talk gives, uh, it's a motivation for our work is to try and put better numbers on sea level rise over the next 100 years. So this plot here, uh, this is model-based projections, uh, 100 years out, IPCC timescales. And you can see here, just for context, so this is like currency level. And even on the bottom edge of that distribution of uncertainty in models, that is a, an amount of sea level rise that could displace up to 4 million people. So this uncertainty here is, is very large, as it is using models of physics as we understand them right now. But when you look at the rates represented here in the context of the geologic past, uh, the current rate of sea level rise is actually this, this solid black line. So you can see in terms of Earth's history, this isn't even like an above average situation. And in terms of the steepest prediction here of this model, that's a dashed line here. So we can see that Earth in the past has been capable of having sea level rise much faster even than our current models uh, most aggressive estimates. And so a lot of the work we try and do is to understand whether that type of sea level rise could be happening or starting to happen in the future. So if you're interested in trying to put numbers on sea level rise uh, and you're really trying to look for a place that could contribute it, uh, the first thing you might look at is where is the bed of the ice sheet grounded below sea level? And you can actually tell a lot about a glaciologist based on what they study. So if you're like super into people, and sea level, and especially like ecosystems. The sea level rise we're experiencing right now is dominantly contributed from like mountain glaciers. So they're very sensitive to uh, atmospheric warming, they're contributing a lot, but you, if you just wipe them all out, it's like 25 centimeters and then you're done. If you are interested in numbers kind of bigger than that, the next thing you might be into is Greenland. And what's really attractive about Greenland is it's very responsive to the climate. So you get these big, beautiful melt lakes on the surface. They drain to the bottom. The ice sheet speeds up as they drain. But the thing is about Greenland, because the edge here, the bed topography along the edge is above sea level, even though in the middle there it's below, there is a maximum speed limit you can hit in terms of how fast Greenland can really collapse. Now, when you think about Antarctica, we talk about sort of splitting Antarctica in half. So West Antarctica is a bit over here in the dark blue. Uh, East Antarctica is over here, and East Antarctica has a ton of ice. It's like 50 meters equivalent sea level. But East Antarctica is kind of for people who are like, like only a real Earth scientist could really like East Antarctica. So it evolves over like geologic time scales, right? And it, can, it governs, you know, seas disappearing and rising. But in order to really be into that, you gotta, you gotta view people as sort of like on the surface, but that's not the point. The point is the Earth and its history and how it changes. And then you've got West Antarctica here, the bit that if you remove the ice would sort of be open ocean. And the thing that's intriguing about West Antarctica, and, and for whatever weird childhood reasons I was very attracted to, is it's, it's capable of uh, abrupt change at low probabilities, or we actually don't even know the probabilities, but it is capable of changing its behavior and increasing sea level significantly, and the reason is because its bed is below sea level. So if we're interested in this, in something that can create these sort of Earth geologic historic levels of sea level rise, the place to look is West Antarctica. Now, if you decided, okay, we're going to look in West Antarctica, the next thing you might decide to look at if you were shopping for a glacier that could collapse, is you say, okay, where is the ice sheet flowing quickly? 
So the plot here on the left is surface velocities that come from satellite uh, radars. Not the type of radars I use, which penetrate through the ice, but radars that look at the surface and measure the velocities. You might be intrigued by areas here. So these dark colors are areas that are flowing quickly. This is an ice shelf. You might get interested in these, this area over here. These are ice streams. These are areas where you have fast-flowing ice right next to areas that are slow-flowing ice. What's really intriguing about them is there's no topographic constraint on the bed. The bed is basically the same. You have an area flowing quickly right next to an area that's flowing slowly. These are also of great interest to people who study uh, earthquake mechanics, because a lot of how they behave is very similar. You could imagine it being similar to earthquakes. Something's flowing, moving quickly next to something slowly, small pressure and, and water variations can govern things. And even this bit here that's flowing slowly now, we know from using ice penetrating radar that 400 years ago, it started flowing slowly. But before that, it was flowing quickly. So there had been another tributary like this. So there was a lot of interest in this area because of these processes, also because the US base is here and it's logistically easy to get people into the field over there. But if you look at how much mass is it losing, if you look at, at orbital satellites, which for those of you who aren't in geophysics, this is like magic that this works. Like what this is doing is you've got two satellites orbiting the Earth and you know the gravitational field varies based on how much mass you have. So you've got the first satellite going over, you've got gravity of the Earth pulling, and if you have more mass, there's more acceleration, so it accelerates and moves away. And you're measuring the range between these two satellites. Right? So this guy kind of speeds up, moves past, sort of slows down, then this guy catches up over a high mass area, it speeds up and catches up. And from that, just those little distances between those satellites, you can then separate and measure the shape of the Earth's gravitational field. And then as you watch that change with time, you can measure it losing mass. That is insane that that works. But it does, or credible people who seem to know what they're doing uh, have persuaded me that it works. And they make plots like this, which are easy to read. And you can say, OK, this area here that looks so interesting, it's sort of in balance. All those processes that were so interesting are sort of negative reinforcing processes. But then there's this giant area over here in the Amnesty and Sea Embayment that is losing a ton of mass. So we're going to focus there and say, OK, let's look at the glaciers in the Amnesty and Sea Embayment. Now within there, so I talked initially that the first thing you're going to look at if you want a glacier that can go away in a hurry is, is the bottom below sea level. The second thing you want to think about is is the bed of the glacier sloping inland? That's the next thing that can really make it unstable. And the reason that is, is that ice flows like a viscous fluid. And so if you think about, like, if, if you took honey and spread it on this table but in a thin layer, it would not flow very quickly. But if I took, like, a cylinder of honey for some reason and, like, took the cylinder off, then you would imagine the honey flowing, like, very quickly. And so that same process, where the thicker it is, the faster it flows, is at play. So now if you imagine a glacier shaped like this, and it's kind of like vomiting icebergs off the edge, as those icebergs go off, it gets thicker and thicker, right? And the thicker it is, the faster it's going, and more icebergs, and thicker and faster, and then it all goes away, right? This is called the marine ice sheet instability, and that's the next thing you can start to look for. So this is the bed topography of Pine Island and Twaits glaciers. They're two of the fastest changing, most potentially unstable glaciers in Antarctica. They're also right next to each other. And you can see, if you look at their bed topography following these two lines, that they both satisfy this condition, that their bed is sloping inland, and they both are, are vulnerable to that type of unstable retreat. However, if you're really interested in a retreat that can spread to the rest of the ice sheet, what would happen if you started with Pine Island and followed this path, you'd hit this bit of high topography, which you can see over here, right? You'd get that bump, and that would stabilize you on some seaward sloping bed. Whereas in the case of Thwaites, the whole way to the center of the ice sheet is nothing but landward sloping bed. And so, uh, you know, when I'm introducing talks or, or grants, sort of the logic you'd like to put out there is like, if you care about humanity, you should care about sea level rise, and therefore continental ice sheets, and therefore Antarctica, and therefore West Antarctica, therefore the Amundsen Sea Embayment, and therefore specifically Thwaites Glacier, which is the glacier I study. So totally objective assessment. But uh, actually, it's not just like my own propagandistic description. There was just a call that went out that was uh, half US, half UK funding, and you could only propose to study this glacier because of this argument, because of its unique situation and its unique capacity to destabilize the West Antarctic ice sheet. So given that, and given that a lot of the community is thinking in this way, there's sort of two mental models you can have if you want to decide to study that glacier. One is that you know, you've got sort of the ice, which is this dumb block of ice, 
sitting on this template of the geology of the continent. And then what's really happening is the ocean. And it's nice to give a talk somewhere cold, because I don't know, for some reason, like in my childhood, I had an experience of using a hose to melt ice. I don't know why you would do that. Uh, seems like the pipes might freeze, but I'm certain I did it. And probably people here have. And in the same way, you put a hose on some ice and it melts. Right? And that's the mental model of the oceanographers and the ocean-driven change, is that the ocean is dynamic and it's changing. It's getting warm water under the ice sheet and melting it and causing this change. There's certainly places that work that way. My mental model tends to be the opposite, which is that the ocean's over here, and sure, it's this big, dumb source of heat, and it's causing change, but what governs the rate at which the ice sheet responds and whether it stabilizes and where it stabilizes is what's happening underneath and within the ice sheet. And so these are things like subglacial hydrology. Do you have a lake? Do you have, there are lakes that pump up and down between each other. When you get water on the bottom, it lubricates the ice sheet. Are the bed conditions, the sediments, are these sediments that deform along with the ice as the ice flows? Are there this bedrock which stabilizes it, the mountain? We have volcanoes in the area of Thwaites Glacier. You have high elevated geothermal flux near that. You see ash layers of volcanic eruptions in the ice sheet. And then even fine scale things like uh, the fabric of the ice itself can govern where you have shear margins, and even if you decide the ocean is really where it's at and what's driving change, the simple mental model of just one little point where you have bed, ocean, and ice meeting is not a complete picture. You can think that you know real topography is happening there. Tides are lifting things up and down, and you're getting water underneath there. You're getting melt and freeze. You're getting capping. So all these processes, to me, are what are interesting and governing once you have warm ocean water pushing the edge of your marine ice sheet. Is it going to stabilize and over what time scales? So in terms of tools you can use to look at this, there's really only one geophysical technique that can allow you to look at the bottom of ice sheets and to study them at the glacier catchment to ice sheet scale. And this is ice penetrating radar. So unlike orbital radar sounders, or orbital radars, which you know are SAR and look sideways and make images of the surface, sounders penetrate the ice and make a profile. So you can see a profile like this. It looks like a cake that's sliced open and you can see layers. This is maybe something uh, more akin to what you would see in seismic exploration. When people are looking for oil and you have profiles rather than like a radar image of the surface you might traditionally associate with remote sensing. It's also traditionally born uh, on airplanes. So you can see an antenna here underneath this DC-3 airplane, uh, which actually fought in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And then like the Mali Air Force owned for some reason and then was bought and converted for this survey. And so it sends out a pulse of radar from the antenna under the wings. It goes through the ice, it comes back, and each one of those pulses uh, makes a vertical line in a profile like this. So this is like four kilometer thick ice. This is, this is actually the curve of the whole ice cap all the way out to the ocean. This is like five, 600 kilometers long. You can see these layers inside uh, the ice cap. These are, uh, these are isochrones, so they're like uh, tree rings for the ice sheet. You can tell about the history of flow. Um, so what people are drilling when they you know, drill ice cores. And you can see from that deformation the history of the ice. The other thing that is interesting about this is if you have any experience with uh, ground penetrating radar for like civil engineering or landmine detection or near surface geophysics, it's often a challenge to get you know meters or tens of meters into the surface, right? Uh, and in this case, we're looking kilometers through the ice. And it's because the ice is an incredibly cooperative medium. And you're getting losses here that are on the scale of like decibels per kilometer, right? So you can get these beautiful pictures. The main purpose of why people were doing these profiles is to make maps like this. So this is what Antarctica would look like without the ice on top. This is just an interpolated collection of a bunch of profiles flown by different nations over decades. You can see some areas like over here are clearly just interpolations. But uh, it's hard actually to fill in. What does it even mean to fill in? You completely survey things in terms of profiles. You don't have that spatial coverage. But initially, this was the whole point of why these things were collected. And my group tends to take this data that was initially used just to map the shape, try and understand information in the echo. So to give you a mental model of what sort of information is in the echo of a radargram, uh, let's talk about initially like looking at a subglacial lake. So this is a radargram of a subglacial lake. You, you have uh, this reflector here. You can say it looks flat, because it looks flat. And you can convince yourself that a lake would melt and freeze and make a flat interface that would be flatter than, say, the bed of an ice sheet. The other thing is that the reflection is brighter. 
And at some point in your high school physics class, you probably had an example where you thought about like a wave propagating on a string. You said, okay, that wave's there on the string, and then you talked about like tying the string to a wall, and you like whipped the string and it hit the wall, and then the reflection came back. And you're like, okay, what if there were like two strings that were the same size? You okay, you get the string, the wave goes, and all of it goes along. And they say, okay, well, what if the string was like super different in size? Then you, mostly if it's reflected, and what if it's kind of close? Then some of it goes through and some of it comes back. That is a totally adequate mental model of like everything we do here. It is, it is in the same way when we say there's a stronger reflection from the water on the bottom of the ice sheet, we're saying that it is very different in terms of propagation. Yes, in terms of electromagnetic waves as opposed to waves on a string, but the reflection you get of say bedrock here versus water is like 30 dB, and that means like 10 to the third. So that means if you have water on the bottom as opposed to the ice, it's gonna be a thousand times brighter than the bed of the ice sheet. So that's a nice big signal you could feel pretty good about seeing. Now the challenge is that you're not just, as opposed to remote sensing of the surface, looking at the surface, you're also propagating through the ice sheet itself. And there's a question is, is that reflection bright because of a reflection of water, which you'd like to interpret, or is it bright because the ice did not absorb that much energy as you were propagating through it? And the main thing to take away from this plot, which is attenuation versus temperature, is one, it gets higher as it gets warmer. That makes sense if you, uh, like your microwave at home, you know, cooks food by vibrating water molecules. It's like designed to vibrate water. But if you put an ice cube in your microwave, it will not melt. Because when it's frozen in that crystal structure, it cannot vibrate in that way. So that same difference of like transferring enough energy to cook something versus not melting at all happens as you start to flirt with the melt uh, of things getting warmer. The other thing to look at is that that vertical axis is dB per kilometer. So that is an exponential unit over a linear unit, and then it looks exponential again. So the whole point is as things get warm, it absorbs an incredible amount of energy. And so now you have this serious confusion or fun of separating what's happening inside or underneath the ice sheet. Okay, so that's an adequate mental model for sort of the type of information we're trying to use. So now I'm gonna go through some examples initially um, for terrestrial glaciology of Thwaites and Pinellian Glacier, um, and then go through some planetary examples for this mission to Europa where everything's the same, ice, radar, water, just colder and less power. So starting with Thwaites, I gave that whole introduction about how great and important Thwaites is. Um, there's also, like I said, this big US-UK proposal where they funded a bunch of investigations with a bunch of acronyms like TARZAN and GHOST and THOR, which didn't even have an acronym, but then everybody else had an acronym, so they made one up. And, and we're gonna go for like the next three years and they're gonna have airplanes and boats and robots and totally, entirely study this glacier with like almost our entire community. And as much of a fan as I am of Thwaites, I think maybe this is a lot. And maybe, maybe we should have a little bit of additional context. So the point I wanna try and make is that Thwaites and Pine Island are next to each other. And other than like the geographic history of them having different names, uh, maybe we should think about them as an interacting system. And I wanna talk about a few areas here right on their boundary. So at the top there, the Bentley Subglacial Trench, this deep, area, and I mean, even if you look now at the shape, if you look at that top bit where the Bentley Trench is, and you were to, and I was to say like, draw a glacier. There are two glaciers here, draw them. It's super weird that you would draw that little lobe up there to flow through Pine Island, right? That's unusual. Also, same thing, you know, the shear margin. Why is that divide between the two glaciers? Many glaciers are divided because there's bed topography that separates them in an obvious way. Not the case there. Also, the Southwest Tributary, that's a bit of ice that flows from one glacier to the other, right? So they're interacting with each other. And then the Eastern Ice Shelf of Thwaites is an area that is decelerating. So we're gonna talk about each of these things and hopefully I'm gonna leave you thinking that maybe we should be thinking about these as a system together. So starting with the Bentley Trench. So in addition to the extreme weirdness of the shape of that sort of like blob of ice flowing into Pine Island rather than Thwaites, if you think about what pathway subglacial water would take, it shows, and this is what those blue pathways are, it shows that they flow through Thwaites instead. And so this is like, if you think about, uh, 
You could imagine with the mountains nearby, thinking about which way water should flow. And you could think through, like if you put an eyedropper of water anywhere on the mountain, you'd say, oh yeah, it kind of flows downhill, and it goes downhill, and it gets to the river, and you could make a nice arborescent network out of that. You can do the same thing underneath ice sheets, just assuming the pressure of ice is on top, and that's how you get plots like this. So the two tremendous weird things are one, just the shape of the Pine Island catchment. The other thing is that the ice flows through Pine Island there at the top, yet the water flows through twice. And that happens almost nowhere, that you have ice flowing through one glacier and water flowing through the other. Now, in order to try and answer these, one of the challenges is that in addition to having different names, they were surveyed by two different radar systems. You can see on the right, the blue was a Texas-built 60 megahertz radar system operated by the US. The red is a British Antarctic survey, 150 megahertz system with interleaf pulses of different sizes. And like Chris was saying, my group's about half electrical engineers and half uh, glaciologists and geophysicists. So from a geophysical perspective, this is a tremendous pain. From a radar engineering point of view, this is awesome. Because uh, what it forces you to do is think through really what is the difference in terms of what roughness and physical scales mean for different wavelengths you use. And almost all interpretation, if you can stick to one system, you can kind of brush it under the rug and say, look, it can't possibly be that big of a deal. But if you're trying to calibrate these two, then you really have to get it right. So after a bunch of work doing that, my student Andrew did, he's a master's degree student. So for the master's degree students in the audience, you should definitely write up your papers before you graduate. Uh, it's, really, it's, it's awesome for everybody uh, if you do that. Uh, anyway, after doing a tremendous and incredible amount of work with that, my, my student Andrew, who's now working at Sandia National Labs, uh, went through and tried to make corrections to then understand what's happening in the ice sheet. And I put this slide up here because, you know, when you give talks like this and people can be like, you never know if students who are interested are in the audience, they're like, oh man, ice sheets are super cool, maybe I'd like what you do. This is, this is the thing that we really do. So if you like this, <laughs> then, then maybe you would like what we do. So. The main point to make here is you're trying to correct for these things. And you guys have a mental model where you're like, oh yeah, Dusty, totally. Attenuation versus reflection, we're totally there. Let's correct for attenuation. And what people, the state of the art was, this top left corner, where you would take the ice thickness and the bed echo power and you try and put a line through it. So already you're like, really, why, why is like dB per kilometer even a constant? Good question. Also, like that doesn't look like a line. It looks like it's steeper on one side, flatter on the other. The other really unsettling piece of it is that if you have a glacier of varying thickness and you have two pieces of thickness that are far apart from each other, what you're going to do is you're going to take those two thicknesses, those two powers, you're going to put them on the same spot on the x-axis. Whereas if you have two pieces of an ice sheet or a glacier that are touching and probably much closer in temperature, but different thickness, they're going to go in different places on your x-axis there. So that is spatial information you're not using. If you look at the top right, that attenuation is just the opposite of power, right? And you can look here and say, look, that's ice thickness and the and negative power. They look like each other, and of course they do. You have a, a glacier getting thicker and thinner and absorbing more and less energy. And you can even imagine here saying, like, yes, I could imagine stretching those and fitting there. And the same type of signal processing you do that makes your cell phone work, that allows us to use the same frequencies, but separate and say a call's coming from me and not you, because that spatial signal, or in this case, the coded signal, is different. You can use that same type of processing to match that spatial signal. So that's one correction you can do. The other correction that you need to do is to think about transmitting through a rough surface. If you look at one of these like super crevassed areas, you say, okay, look, it's all rough. You're propagating away from through that. Surely that has an effect. And if you have experience here of reflecting off of the surface, you know that the material doesn't matter. It's just the geometry because what's happening here is some of the wave is kind of moving fast farther than the other. And that difference in the distance it travels causes destructive interference and you lose energy. So that's an intuition you could have from surface remote sensing. Now, then you think about, okay, well, we're going to propagate through a rough surface, and surely that messes with it even more. However, the intuition it decides, and this is where you know, I did my PhD in, in an earth science department, and one of the, the cracks that made me realize I was starting to think like an earth scientist was I was in an argument about the Europa mission where people who were who were simulating the surface, who were very good electromagnetics people, were like, our simulation says we're going to destroy the signal. And my response was, well, I flew in this airplane, and we went over this really rough stuff, and we totally saw the bottom. So what about that? 
There's like real geologic stuff there. And the reason that that inductive uh, line of logic worked is that when you're propagating through a rough surface, it is not just the geometry. It is the fact that that little piece of the wave that's moving through the ice is moving a little slower than the piece that's moving through the air. And so if the material doesn't have very much of a different speed, the roughness doesn't matter. So if you had a really rough surface out of aerogel or something, it would have no effect. But a less rough surface with very different speeds would have a big effect. And in fact, if you look at the dielectric here of 1.2 for snow, it could be very rough. And you could imagine here on the surface, so the reflection on the surface could lose 20, 30 dB, like a thousand, lose like uh, get down to like one one thousandth of its power, and you could lose you know one or two dB, you know, single digit percentages. And so this is why we are able to one, uh, see through those rough glaciers, and two, convince NASA to let us send this radar to Europa and think it might work. So you do all those corrections, and what comes out is a plot like this. So the reflectivity is a proxy for water. You saw that before. So the red colors are watery colors. And in the top, and uh, it's the same background in both of these, except you have different water pathways. And what happened in this case is because our surveys are just these profile lines, there's not a lot of certainty on what the topography looks like. So we just added some random noise to the topography. And adding sort of 10 meters of random noise, you could change this one, <coughs> which was like the beginning one, where you have the water flowing through Thwaites, to like this one where you see that same trench up top flows through Pine Island. And if you look at the dark blue area, so if this, you look at this pathway, you say, okay, in the Bentley Trance, there's sort of greenish stuff, there's some water there, it's gonna come out of Thwaites, definitely water there, but it's flowing through that dark blue spot which is like definitely frozen bed, so hard to imagine water could go there. Whereas in the top case, now you have sort of greenish areas flowing through sort of light bluish stuff into that red area in Pine Island. So certainly the pattern matches the idea of water flowing through Pine Island instead. And this is interesting for two reasons. One, it reconciles this weirdness of why would water flow one way and ice flow the other way. The other thing is, if this is the case, this could explain why the ice is shaped like it is, that the water's flowing that way, and that's what's lubricating the ice and allowing it to flow through this other glacier. So that's, you know, glaciologically intriguing, but if with 10 meters of bed topographic difference we can change where it's routed, that means you can change a water flow pathway, then all of a sudden take that big chunk of ice from and have it flowing from into Pine Island into Thwaites, and that changes your sea level estimates, it changes how your glacier evolves as either one retreats. All right. So in addition to that upper bit, so hopefully now you're like, oh man, that upper bit, the Bentley Trench, who knows who that belongs to. Now we look at the divide between the two glaciers. So this is shown the boundary between Thwaites and Pine Island on the top there. And if you look at all these black lines, which are the shear margins, all of them except the top one, I think you could draw them in. You could say, yeah, look, that kind of curves around a volcano, totally, you know, here's some red highs, it flows around there, flows around there. But man, that eastern shear margin on the top, that does not make any sense. This is zooming in. That is high topography you're flowing across. Why is that divide there? So that is intriguing. In fact, this paper here is titled something like, why is this divide where it is? We don't know. Um, so what you do is you go through and you look and you make those same corrections with the radar data. And what you see is if you look at the ice velocity on top, and if you look here at the divide in terms of reflectivity, the inside margins are about 10 dB brighter. That means they're more reflective, wet, uh, a wet bed versus a frozen bed outside. Now there's questions you could ask. You'd say, okay, chicken and then egg, is it that this area is flowing fast, it's warmer, it's creating friction, and that's why the water's there, and it was there for some other reason, totally plausible, or is it the case that the only thing we see dividing these things is where the bed is frozen versus thawed, and wet versus not? In which case then, what could be controlling it is bed conditions. And when we look back that whole area of the Sipal Coast with those ice streams where I was saying, oh man, they're super interesting but unimportant for sea level rise, when we look at those guys, those guys reorient themselves. They have shear margins moving. So if this divide between the two fastest, most potentially unstable glaciers in Antarctica is controlled by bed conditions like that, all of a sudden now its lateral extent is also up for grabs. So this is actually the, my piece of where I'm participating in this big ground-based you know, acronym soup. Uh, I was on a proposal, uh, so most of what I do is airborne, but I was on a proposal to do a ground-based survey of this margin itself. Um, and so what we're doing is there's sort of two hypotheses of why the margin is where it is in addition to these bed conditions or what might sustain it. <clears throat> One is that you could imagine uh, that the margin itself is warm ice, which would make it softer and therefore sustain itself, and once it's going, it keeps going. 
So there are theoretical analytic models for that. It's what we're trying to do observationally uh, is actually we're taking a stationary radar system that was developed by the British Antarctic Survey and University College London. It's this FMCW low power radar that you sort of sits on the surface, you bury like a cache of car batteries, it sends a pulse like every hour, right? And so you use it to observe change. And uh, one of my students is taking a software defined radio which can be used to develop like uh, little radio applications, but actually some of them are for, for electronic warfare, for like uh, recording uh, like all the uh, Wi-Fi signals in this room in order to look through them afterwards, right? Uh, so you take one of those things that what she's done is she's used it to eavesdrop on this other radar, which is a much easier signal because no one's encrypting it or anything crazy, and slowly walk away across the margin listening to that radar signal, and you can imagine with these paths moving through this hypothetical warm region, you could then do tomography and then try and say, is there the type of attenuation you expect to see if it's a warm signal? So that's one hypothesis. I also have this postdoc who did his PhD on fish optics. So apparently, mantis shrimp have circularly polarized skin and can see circularly polarized light. And that's how they can find other mantis shrimp to like fight or mate or something. And so anyway, this guy can simulate in his PhD, the circular polarization of fish skin. And so in figuring out things we could do together in the group, he took a similar approach to looking at the fabric of ice sheets itself. And so what he's showing here is taking, again, one of these ground-based systems. They're polarized, they're dipoles, and you kind of do like a pirouette with your radar, and you look as a function of this angle, how does the phase and power relate? And the main thing that is striking about this is that that bottom signal in each of those cases is pure analytic modeling of ice crystal fabric. And the top signal is real experimental measurements from the Greenland ice sheet with people like, turning around with a radar. And what you can see there is both the existence of ice fabric with a preferred orientation, the orientation of that fabric as well. And now you can start to look at that depth and orientation. And because these different fabrics have different rheologic properties and strengths, you could ask questions like, is it actually the fine scale fabric of the ice that's governing and reinforcing why the shear margin is where it is? Is And you can do it using these like pirouette radar surveys. OK, moving downstream. So again, sort of flipping the axis, you have this tributary uh, flowing from Thwaites into Pine Island. That's sort of weird enough. Um, what you can also see, though, is that Pine Island is moving so those colorful lines moving in, the ocean starting to work on the edge and retreat there. And what you can see in both the top plot, which is velocities, you can see the blue color, that sort of blue triangle on the coast. That is a bit of bed that is frozen. And on the bottom here, we can kind of see it here, right, which also shows it is frozen from the radar. So we have this one little piece of coast dividing these two glaciers. Right, that has a frozen piece of bed. And we've just talked about starting from way up top, where there's not strong control on the top of where this divide is. Here's the shear margin. Not strong control of why that shear margin is where it is. Here, maybe pinning on the bottom is this little frozen piece of ice. Maybe that is what sets the divide between these two. And now, all of a sudden, you've got ocean water coming in on the edge. And you can really think about that warm ocean water getting in and maybe thawing that piece and you know, pulling the plug on all of it. So what we end up doing here is taking a reflight. And I'll show you for context, you know, for anybody who's done like orbital remote sensing, uh, you get like a bunch of repeats and crossovers and you can do all sorts of fancy stuff. In the airborne world, that top right plot is like as good as it gets in repeat sensing. That is one line in 2004 in red with one radar system and two lines in 2012 and 2014 with a different radar system. And this is like awesome. Uh, because the whole point was they were trying to fill in this map and why would they go fly the same place twice? And what is great about it is all of a sudden now when you take those two and you compare the differences, all these uncertainties on what is attenuation, what is reflectivity, what is the geometry, a lot of that is constant. And what you can see is the difference. And you can see this alternating pattern of brightness increasing and decreasing. And that's just two separate ocean processes, melting and smoothing things out and crevassing and flexure. But you can see that there's this point inland of which there's no change. right? So we can say that ocean processes are working sort of 10 kilometers inland from the point we would say from satellite measurements where we think the grounding line is. And so we can say that this tributary here, which is separating the two, is starting to have the ocean work on the edge of it. And so we're going to see if it can really thaw that, that happening. All right. The final piece I'll talk about is the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. 
So the plot over here to the left uh, is surface lowering and acceleration. What you can see in red, and this is a changing reason, right? This is everybody's going there because it's all changing. So you see everything's red, of course. But there's that little spot of blue there. And why on earth is there this one blue decelerating ice shelf? And the reason for that is very complicated, but it's basically that the tongue of Thwaites there, the, the you know, label that Thwaites tongue, that's bigger, it's moving faster, and it used to be attached, and so it was sort of dragging that ice shelf along with it. And then a uh, fracture happened, and it separated. And then on the very edge of the eastern ice shelf, there was a, there's a, a ridge underneath the water that it regrounded on and slowed down, so it's stabilizing. Now, what is interesting about that is one, you know, there's a lot of reason. If you have an area that's, that's decelerating, maybe this is a stabilizing hope. And it also is buttressing that same little triangle of frozen bed that I was just saying is maybe keeping the two glaciers separated. So maybe this way it's eastern ice shelf is going to save us. Can we say something about that? Now, the tool we have, because like I just said, there's not a lot of repeat data, is we are lucky that the very first ice penetrating radar data that was collected in Antarctica uh, was collected in the late 60s by very impressive post-World War II engineers who did all of this in analog circuitry and produced optical films uh, like that in the top middle. That looks like a radar gram that was recorded on 35 millimeter optical film. And then you also had traces like that in the top right. So uh, what I ended up doing was spending a decent amount of my startup on this, uh, this Hollywood film scanner here that's meant for retouching old Hollywood movies. Uh, and then I had these two art historian friends who happened to be out of work somehow. And uh, we went to uh, Cambridge for two weeks and scanned like a thousand reels of film. We hand archived these things. Uh, I was like using my startup to bid against hipsters on eBay to buy these like hand film winding things. And uh, what we produced were like two million images. And what it got you is a couple of things. One uh, is here on the right, this is actually the same area piece of film. So the top was what was available in publications from this piece of film and print. The bottom is our scan, so you can see the difference there. Also, just from a point of view of measurements of the bed topography itself, you can see the difference between the blue line and the red line, and depending on how uncharitable you want to be, maybe green line or orange line, but definitely there is no cheating involved in comparing the blue line and the red line, that all that fine scale, like one kilometer stuff, we've added with this scan. What you can also do is super luckily, and this, you know, at the time this was flown, Thwaites was not even a thing. They were just mapping, trying to see what the continent, like at all, mountain, yes, no, general shape was, but they had this one line that went over the Thwaites eastern ice shelf. And so you can see those top two green lines, the top two radar grams are modern, like 2009 radar surveys. And in the gray, you can see the 1960 survey. And I mean, amazingly, you can even see like same bed shape, same profile shape. But you can start to look at, and it's hard to see here, but kind of maybe between the two blue dashed lines on the bottom, that's a piece where you're grounding on that offshore ridge. And now, <clears throat> which caused the deceleration in the first place. And you can see in those upper two radar grams, the blue line to the yellow lines, how small that grounding on the ridge is. And so now by comparing this over 40 years, we can see the process of ungrounding. We can see how much longer it's able to hold on. And this is super useful because one of our big challenges, if you're trying to make these IPCC timescale predictions, is you're trying to pre predict how the ice sheet is going to behave in like 30 or 40 years. And it's hard to do that. But in this case, we have 40 years in the past till now what's happening on the subsurface. And if you can model and understand that, you can have a lot more confidence moving forward on the same time scale. So hopefully that convinced you guys that Thwaites and Pine Island should be thought about as a system uh, and giving you a feel for the type of stuff you can do with terrestrial glaciology. Oh, a couple more. Sorry. Uh, also, all right, so that's the current state of things. That's totally accurate to my current understanding of everything we can say at this moment. However, in the news recently, even though it's been uh, in the literature since Scott himself, uh, there is surface melt in Antarctica. Now, it's a major process in Greenland. In Antarctica, you see them off of ice shelves. It is not yet on the top of the ice sheet where you would expect to see it affecting things, but it can be, and certainly in a warming world, this is a serious consideration. So if we're talking about moving forward, what might change the equation is looking at now moving to Greenland, uh, the idea of fern aquifers. 
So in Greenland, you get these lakes on the surface. They drain to the bed. That's a sort of simple canonical story. But there are observations of pervasive and sometimes temporary in glacial storage. And so uh, these are actually pretty hard to measure. You see them uh, in higher frequency radars. You can kind of see the top. And then people will go in with seismic to confirm this. And this is a paper by uh, my postdoc, Winnie Chu, where she took our same airborne radar surveys and constrained the size. Now, one, it is amazing to me how good the radar looks with the seismic. That is like much better matching than I'm used to seeing with the types of stuff we come up with. But the other thing I really love about this is the way it works, because we could not resolve it. We could not see this water layer. And so what happened, it <coughs> or the way it worked, was she took an ice sheet model that predicted the temperature of the ice sheet. And because you guys saw in that earlier slide, you can imagine, OK, if I know the temperature, I can take the attenuation. And then we took the observed reflection of the bed of the ice sheet, looking through this. And we looked at the difference of what was predicted in terms of attenuation and what we observed. And all that extra loss, we said, there must be something we can't see absorbing that energy. And that difference is what is used to then make this. So I think this is amazing, both from a, from a <coughs> ability to do what you would do with seismic over a whole ice sheet scale, also demonstrating the power of sort of uh, model data synthesis to, to really move forward in what you can constrain. We also combine this with one of these ground-based radar surveys. So this is a PRES array. So this is the same radar system I was talking about that you leave out on the surface, sends a few pulses an hour for like a year. And <coughs> Mostly it's used for thinning and melt rates. People have used it to measure ice shelves thinning or vertical velocities in the ice column. In this case, we are looking at how the <coughs> echo changed with time. And what you can see here is you can see that the echo drops by like 50 dB. Once again, this is the luxury of these type of signals. These are giant. There's many things you could say is this causing this temperature you know, system change, but 50 dB is giant. And so what we're able to see is if you take and ask the question and say, well, what could cause this? What if the hypothesis was that water was being stored in glacially? We know from weather stations about how much water is being stored. And you can say that actually most of it is being stored into the winter. So this is an area. This is in the ablation zone. This is not an area where you would expect to see a fern aquifer at all. Yet the ice sheet in damaged area is holding on to this water into the winter and letting it go before the following summer. So. <coughs> If you want to think about processes that will change in a warming world, I think these are two things that will start to play a role in the future, as opposed to the things that we could see now. OK, we'll do a little tour into planetary. <coughs> so planetary radar sounders uh, exist currently on Mars. So there's two, <coughs> two separate radar sounders um, at two separate frequencies that you can use to study the Mars polar ice caps. And there's two sounders in work for the Jupiter system. Everything I told you about so far uh, was flown like 500 meters above the surface using like a 10 kilowatt transmitter. <coughs> this is flying hundreds of kilometers or at least tens of kilometers above the surface and using a 10 watt transmitter. And the only reason that works, as you guys now, now know, is that ice is very temperature dependent, it's attenuation, and space is cold. And that is why it works. So. The goal here in Reason, which is this mission to Europa, is to use a two-frequency radar system to study the ice shell. And I'm involved with this when I was at JPL. I helped do some of the initial systems engineering and design for the radar. I'm now on the science team. And with total bias, I will tell you this is the most important radar and instrument on the spacecraft. And it's going to answer all these questions. Right? So one, we're going to look for shallow subsurface water. Two, we're going to map the subsurface ocean. Three, we're going to talk about exchange processes moving up and down the ice shell. We're also going to say things about the gravitational tide and geodesy. And then we're going to find you know, places for a lander to land, all with a two-frequency radar sounder. So OK, we'll go through a couple of these things. In that cartoon, what we showed is that you had a two-frequency radar system. And the reason for that, no pun intended, is that uh, it depends on what you're more scared of in terms of the radar performance. So this is an image of chaos terrain. It is really rough. And if you are scared of surface roughness, like the person I was arguing about earlier about the rough simulation, then what you want to do is you want to go really low in frequency so you have really long wavelengths so you don't lose things in that roughness. So that would make you really enthused about the 9 megahertz band. However, Jupiter radio emissions <coughs> is such that uh, above 40 megahertz, you have a 60 dB jump in the strongest radio emissions you can get. And that apparently is from 
particles being emitted from Io's volcano, another moon of Jupiter, that then spin around the magnetic field lines of Jupiter, that then emit these beams of super noisy radio emissions exactly at the frequencies we'd like to use. So if you're more scared of that, then you like the higher frequencies. And then in our case, because we're scared of both, we put two frequencies on, and then you can operate everywhere. So another clarification to make is that in the planetary community, there's a lot of desire to use the term penetration depth. And you can understand why that would be appealing. If you're used to like a camera, you say, oh, well, there's like resolution cells is like how big my pixel is. And then I look over this area, and that's kind of what I can see. Surely a radar is like that. But the difference is with a radar, when you're penetrating something, it is really up to the moon and not your radar how deep you penetrate. Because it's all about how warm it is. And so if these are all different simulations of the Europa ice shell. But let's say for now that we have like 100 dB of attenuation we can experience. And let's say that this is the kind of Europa we have. So what you'd look at and you say, OK, you really, if you want to get that red line, you're really only talking about maybe five kilometers thick, you see the ocean. So then you can say, OK, penetration depth is like five kilometers. So you're totally hosed if your you know, depth is like 30 kilometers. Well. If their depth is 30 kilometers, you're getting like 28 kilometers through before you hit that same attenuation. And that makes sense because you're only going to get the warm ice very close to the ocean. So you're going to get kind of like most of the way through most of the ice shell, no matter what. So one, so that penetration depth is very misleading. The other thing is you can imagine using this signal and this pattern to constrain the thickness of the ice shell. So even if you don't get to the ocean and see that echo, if you map that depth to which you lose the echo, that's going to be an attenuation. It's going to be an attenua iso attenuation level, which to first order is sort of an isotherm. And you can see from that shape whether you have convective shells and how thick the shell is overall. So you don't have to see the ocean to constrain it geophysically. OK. There's also thought uh, that there should be shallow water. So even if the ice shell is thick, in order to get these thick, thick ice shells, you need solid state convection to sustain them. So you have warm ice like the atmosphere sort of moving up, and then you have these cells, and then cold ice moves down. And if you're moving up salty ice, you can cross a eutectic point where you melt and make these lenses of salty water. And the hope is, so the one on the left is a chaos region, the one on the right is an iceberg on Earth. Yeah, they look like each other, and that's the goal, is to, to get a radar gram that looks like that and be like, that is the ocean, there's some water, there's going to be some space goop in there, send the lander, and find aliens. Now, the challenge with that, in a flyby geometry, because the Europa mission is just doing these sets of flybys, is that you got to be pretty sure before you send your $2.5 billion lander down that what you saw was a reflection from the ocean. It wasn't a reflection from a, a pathologically positioned ridge off to the side. So a normal radar sounder with, without you know, multi-channel capability just gives you the top picture here. Now what we're going to do is we're saying there's two channels. And you can imagine in this geometry, right, the path from something below is going to kind of go the same distance in both. And you can imagine if the distance is the same and you think about a wave, the phase of the wave is kind of the same. And you can imagine on the side if the distance is different then the phase of the wave is different. And you could have used those together to say, is this from below or the side? Now, if any of you actually do interferometry, this is a really blindingly bad interferometer. Like we, we, need, we should have way more channels. If you want to uniquely position this, we're wrapping the hell out of the phase. There's lots that's really bad about this. But it is good enough for this using the scientific method. So the whole idea is, and this is a demonstration in Greenland, is you find you get a radar gram, and here are these two features. And you can say, which of these is the bed of the ice sheet? And I look at this type of stuff for a living, and I couldn't tell you which of those is the ice sheet bed. Now, fortunately, it's Earth, so we can project them on the image up top. And we say, oh, yeah, one of them is the edge of the moon attack, one of them is the bottom of the ice sheet. But you can take and you can say, OK, well, let's think about what the face should be like in the two hypotheses. One is, what if it's at the bed? In that case, the path's going to be the same. The phase should be kind of zero. And you can see those top two cases are what it would be like if that was the case. Noisy, but kind of near zero. Now you can take the same two delays and say, OK, what if we, those are from the surface? We project those to the surface, and you know what the phase should look like. So you see they have those two different shapes that correspond to their two different depths. And now you can take the phase measurements on the bottom. And as noisy and wrapped as they are, 
you can say that this one looks a lot more like it's clutter signal and that one looks a lot more like it's signal signal. And you can use that phase history to say, is that indeed a subsurface water body at Europa, send a lander, or nope, mountain off to the side. All right, so this is some of the, you know, I think uh, the fun with planetary missions is that you're so resource constrained that you can develop really sort of Rube Goldberg approaches to things uh, that on Earth you would just, you know, add a few antennas and be done with it. Uh, so that's really fun. Also of similar flavor is uh, using the radar sounder for geodesy. So if you know exposure to geodesy, especially planetary geodesy, um, you can apparently tell a lot about the moon of Jupiter from measuring like two or maybe three scalar numbers. So one number, H2, is like as Europa is orbiting Jupiter from different distances, it's got different tidal forces, it's like squeezing in and out. So that's H2, is how much does it squeeze in and out, kind of similar to tides, right? K2 is a little more confusing. It's the idea of moving mass within the moon. But you could imagine if the moon had a hard shell, but like inside of it had a bunch of mass you could redistribute, but that would change. That would change its gravitational field. And then there's L2, which is librations, which is sort of wiggling side to side, right? So in orbiting missions where you have lasers, you actually measure all of these things with like a million crossovers because you're orbiting it. But in our case, we're a flyby mission. We just have this handful of crossover points there. You hope that they are at the spots where if you were squeezing this thing in and out, where you would have a big difference, because if you go sort of mid-squeeze, you don't see it, right? And then also, we did not have a laser altimeter or a, an instrument that was meant for measuring small things. So like the range resolution of a laser altimeter inherently to it is in the order of meters. Of a, of a radar sounder, it's like 10 meters, 15 meters, not what you would normally use. However, <laughs> if you take simple hypotheses, like ocean versus no ocean, and if you take the radar and you use it with a DTM, so I, I had this uh, student working with me who was one of these laser geodesy guys, and his initial mental model was like that top picture, which is like a radar is like a really bad laser. So like, it's like on all those mountains, and then you say, oh man, who knows where that echo comes from? You look at that top sort of cartoon echo, who even knows what the right echo is? <coughs> and that's true. But the mission also has this, this stereo camera that is making digital terrain models. And so now you can imagine if you took that digital terrain model and you simulated the radar data, like this little red cartoon, you could imagine sliding those up and down, and you could actually probably position those really accurately. And then all of a sudden, what happens is all these echoes off to the side go from being error sources, because you don't know which way is down, to being information of little separate range Doppler echoes that you could then cross-register to know your position. And this is both interesting in terms of giving us this opportunity to do geodesy on the mission. It also opens up a totally different architecture for doing sort of low-cost CubeSat-type planetary exploration, because you can kind of take almost two slightly better than webcams and get stereo imagery. You can take a sounder, big, dumb, you know, antennas like a, like a radio antenna that deploy. And if you can put these two together, they can give you these ranges. Also, because the beam pattern of the antenna is sort of isotropic, it's not in any direction, it doesn't matter how well you point it, as opposed to a laser, which cares a lot about how accurate you point it. So it's a very interesting approach from that point of view. And the point we were making <coughs> in this paper that you can see in the top is what we showed is that that top line is what you could do with the radar. And the bottom line is what you could do with positioning the spacecraft better. No change to the altimeter. <coughs> so the takeaway from this was sort of like, sure, if you have an orbital mission with a laser altimeter, you can do like this much geodesy. Awesome. In a case with uh, the radar, your intuition, if you don't think about these sort of out-of-the-box ways, is that you're doing like this much. And what we're saying is, well, look, uh, this isn't an orbiter, so you're really limited in what you can do with the laser. And the radar's not that bad. So, actually, since we're on this mission where you kind of don't know where it is, you don't have any crossovers, actually, this is totally good enough. Very inspiring message. Um, so, anyway, so that's there, and we're totally going to do it. Uh, the final things I'll bring back to you is sort of steps forward that you could use in either planetary or, or terrestrial settings. Um, the first one is maybe the most interesting thing to come out. You know, a lot of what uh, I've done has been stuff that has I've done terrestrially and then moving it to the Europa setting. This is an opposite case. 
Um, so like I was talking to you about earlier, you have this, this loud Jovian radio emissions, and it keeps you from using these frequent, these lower frequencies there because it's so loud. And one of my colleagues at JPL actually had a paper where he said, well, what if we use that as the signal? <clears throat> and initially when he told me, I was really convinced it was impossible. And to his credit, you know, after I attacked him publicly at AGU, he was like, hey, we both work at JPL. How about uh, you join my meetings? We could talk about it. I'm like, I don't think you remembered like what I was saying. Like, I didn't think it would work. And he's like, what I heard was you read our paper. Uh, <laughs> and so we worked together and argued about it for a year. And I learned that that radio astronomers are like deeply optimistic people, uh, because I think for them they're like you know looking for small signals or particle physicists, right? Whereas like radar engineering comes from like is a missile coming to kill me? And like as a result, you know I think the radar engineering culture is a lot more conservative. So I'd be like, look, 99% of the cases this definitely definitely doesn't work. He's like, awesome, 1%. Uh, <coughs> and so as a result of that pushing back and forth, one, uh, we showed that in a wide variety of settings this would work. And the whole idea here is in a normal radar pulse, you have a pulse, you know its shape, you send it out, and at that moment of transmission, it's much stronger than the background environment. But then it spreads out as it goes out, and you lose energy. In the passive case, the wave is coming like a plane wave, and you don't lose that. Now, the signal-to-noise ratio, when you get it, is real small. It's like half, but, <coughs> but it suffers none of that spreading. And then what you do is, you, instead of correlating what you receive with the signal you know, you take the noise signal and you cross-correlate it with itself. If you think about it, noise looks random. It looks like nothing else, but it looks just like itself. And so what you end up doing is you slide these things past each other, and you find that echo and a correlation between something that looks like itself just weaker. And one of the statements uh, when I was leaving JPL and I was recruiting my first student, and to his credit, my first student chose this problem, which I described to him as either going to revolutionize the field or utterly fail. And he's like, that sounds awesome. Uh, and, uh, and then we said, like, if you're able to do this, you should be able to just take a radio antenna and listen to the sun and measure the reflections. This is like the world's cushiest glaciology field work. You used to drive down the Big Sur and watch the sunset. And uh, what you do is you get the direct path of the sun and then the reflection off the ocean surface. You did the delay. And in fact, you saw you were able to measure that ranging with that. And what's amazing with that is now this summer, he's done it in uh, Sore Glacier in Greenland. He does have an echo. He's you know a careful graduate student. He doesn't want me showing it, but it's totally going to work, guys. And from that, then all of a sudden, you can make these low-cost radars that you can you don't have to transmit, they're low power, you could leave them out, both in terms of planetary exploration and even the idea of tossing out thousands or hundreds of these things on an ice shelf to measure melt rates becomes really practical using the sun or maybe even you know, TV stations, radio stations, other man-made sources. Along those lines, one of the things that's been lovely about being at Stanford is this big undergraduate engineering uh, group. And I, you know, I had a hard time getting students initially to take my intro to geophysics course, but I got like 20 students who showed up to do research for free, uh, building radars, which was awesome. And uh, my undergrads built this amazing RF PCB radar, um, which <coughs> you attach to a software to find radio. Uh, like here, and you can send out and receive pulses. So this form factor was for putting on a balloon, uh, but you could imagine adding some slightly more powerful transmitters and using them in a, in a ground-based setting. And we're having a lot of success both in using the stationary radar I mentioned uh, and eavesdropping on that, or even just building uh, active ground-based systems that you can process coherently. So I think this is really a step forward, and it's going to be you know, the type of development they're doing is what's going to eventually be on arrays of drones, which is eventually going to be on CubeSats. Um, loads of fun. And then finally, the question that <coughs> comes up often um, is, look, at, we just talked about Europa and at Mars that we do these orbital sounding, yet we're doing all this airborne sounding on Earth. Why don't we do orbital sounding <coughs> around Earth? There's three things that make this challenging if you decide you're interested in this. One reason is the Earth's ionosphere is challenging. That's true. It's harder than other planets. Fine. But that is a solvable challenge. The other thing is the FCC, which does not exist on Mars or Europa. And as a result, we're limited in the bands we can use. And through the approval process, uh, we're basically stuck to two potential bands. One is P-band, which is like 400 megahertz, and that's available. Could do it. Um, but it's kind of higher frequencies than we typically use. And the other is this 45 megahertz band, 
which came out of a paper that was written by an internal study, and that number was kind of picked, and then the paperwork was filed with the international version of the IPCC, or the, the FCC, and they are working on allocating that band. So this is kind of the two bands we've got to talk about. Um, and that one will take longer to get allocated. So that's one, so just a human constraint. The other constraint, which is super interesting, is that, like I was saying earlier, a lot of this frequency-dependent stuff gets swept under the rug because it doesn't vary spatially at the scale that you would care as a scientist who is interpreting airplane data. But if you want to say, how much power do I need from orbit to be able to map the ice sheet, all of a sudden, those extrapolations matter a great deal. And uh, one of the things I was talking about earlier, because you have such a strength in fern here, is some of the P-band data that was collected has shown echoes from fern depths. And normally we assume these wavelengths are so long that from the fern that there could be no volume scattering. But if there is volume scattering at P-band, all of a sudden the fern could actually cause so much clutter that it blinds you from orbit. And so <coughs> actually chasing down this frequency-dependent stuff uh, will allow us to assess what we actually need for orbit and whether we can operate at P-band. So that's what I have for these two, and thank you very much for listening.